And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of glad that we've come to the end of another week and looking forward to the weekend, spending time, a little bit of time with Mary today and um, spending time in the house of the Lord on Sunday. Looking forward to that a lot. Uh, we're going to continue our Victorious Life series today and talking about uh, the person of victory today. But before we begin with that, let's read the word of the Lord from Psalm 84, beginning with verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of weeping, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, bless this man who trusts in you. And isn't that the truth? The Lord has so much that he wants to do in our lives. He is covering us. He's walking with us. He's providing for us. It's an amazing thing. It's better to be just inside a watchman, a doorman in the house of the Lord than anything else. And that's the truth. We want to be where he, where he is. Okay. You know, we live in... In very busy times, we live in very hurried lives, and many people seldom take the time to get alone with God and hear from him. That's why I love reading uh, David in the Psalms. Uh, you know, in eternity, uh, I don't know that we're going to do this, but we would have forever to think about what we could have done, should have done, should have said, or what we even could have been for God. I don't know that we're going to do that in heaven. I think we're going to be occupied with worship and other things the Lord has for us. But, you know, if we are to live victoriously right now, a time and a place will come when we're going to have to make a decision. We're going to meet the man with the sword that we're going to talk about today from Joshua chapter 5. We're going to meet him and uh, we're going to learn to know him in a personal way. Many people are sidetracked by um, the abundance of amusements uh, that we have around us today in our culture. It's interesting, I don't know if you knew this, but the word amuse comes from two Greek words. Uh, the first one means a, 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 meaning no, and muse meaning think. In other words, amuse means no think. <laughs> That's the problem with a lot of our culture. There's no thinking. No time to get alone with God. Now, during their time with, in Gilgal, uh, the Israelites had come to be alone with God. And today we're going to look at Joshua 5, verses uh, 10 through 15. So if you're looking there in your Bible. But I actually want to start with verse 14, just to have a context of, of what uh, is beginning to happen. Uh, it says in verse 14, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Uh, the Israelites had camped in Gilgal about a mile and a quarter from Jericho. They could see Jericho playing. Uh, and those were significant days, these three days that are covered in this passage that we're looking at today. They're significant days of going with God. And uh, we can see the seriousness of that. Uh, you and I have the choice to have the person of victory in our lives. And so we're going to look at some truths related to that person of victory uh, that uh, we're going to talk about today. The first one is that we have to recognize that there is a reality of God's purpose in us. And so there's a, there's a process of recognizing what that purpose is. Verse 10. While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. So the Israelites, now remember, they've already crossed the Jordan. Now they're in the promised land, but barely in the promised land. 
And, and the Israelites had not celebrated Passover for 38 years. Um, wow. The, if, you and I, if, if we were to just not recognize what God had done for us for 38 years, that would be, it's not even in your, in your mindset, right? If you, and that for us, if we've never allowed the, the blood of Jesus to cover our sins and, and we want peace and joy, we have to come to a place where we let Christ come to do what he came to do. The Passover celebrates that. Passover was celebrated uh, uh, there on the plains of Jericho for the first time in 38 years. Finally, they're saying, okay, God, thank you for bringing us out of Egypt. Seems kind of lost in the in the shuffle, doesn't it? Something something else also happened on that day, verse 11. And on the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. So what you have to recognize is that not only did they have a renewal of their faith with the Passover, but they also received a new food. See, manna had been intended to sustain them, but now... They're in the promised land. There's corn, there's wine, there's grapes, there's pomegranates, milk, honey. Uh, it's all there in the promised land. And so uh, on that day, manna stopped. Did you know that? It actually stopped on the day they celebrated Passover. Now, in order to celebrate Passover, all of the, all of the sheep that they had been then uh, herding for all of these years, they sacrificed them, right? They they ate them and Passover meal. So manna is not good enough for a Canaan victory, for the victorious life or conquering Jericho. There's a whole new diet. There's a whole whole new way to do things. We need new food, new faith, and a new relationship with God Almighty if we're to step into and conquer the enemy, and step into the, the, the uh, place that God has for us and conquer the enemies that are opposing us. The Passover celebrated, new food is consumed, and then there's an, there's something else that happens. Uh, well, verse 12, I kind of let the bat, cat out of the bag. And the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. Listen, all of the griping and complaining about manna is all gone. After tasting what God had prepared for them in the promised land, who wants to go back to manna? Who wants to go back to what's this? <laughs> even now, you know, there are people who are frustrated and aggravated and defeated that are even God's people that are doing that. There are a lot of people that come to God's house on Sunday and sing and shout. However, some of those same people can be seen mourning on Monday tense on Tuesday, worried on Wednesday, troubled on Thursday, frustrated on Friday, and awfully sad on Saturday. But when Sunday comes, uh, it's Canaan time again. Hmm. See, God wants us not to only sing and shout on Sunday, but also to be ministering on Monday, trusting on Tuesday, worshiping on Wednesday, thankful on Thursday, fruitful on Friday, and saving the lost on Saturday. Then when we return to the house of God on Sunday, we actually have something that we can sing and shout about. So we can honestly report that everything is awesome in God's presence, walking with him. Camping in Canaan and living off the land does not bring the joy of Jesus in our hearts and lives. You know, we need to know who we serve story is told and actually it's a written story so it's pretty reasonably accurate uh, because it was written long ago not in today's culture of journalism but many years ago a, a 17 year old boy attended a christian school and one subject that they they dealt with was uh the union of believers with christ and he was told to write uh you know some thoughts about that, uh, you know, an essay, right? And so this is what he wrote. He said, when we consider also the history of individuals, when we consider the nature of man, it is true that we always see a spark of divinity in his breast, a passion for what is good, a striving for knowledge, a yearning for truth. But the sparks of the eternal are extinguished by the flames of desire. 
Enthusiasm for virtue is drowned by the tempting voice of sin. It is scorned as soon as life has made us feel full of power. The striving for knowledge is supplanted by a base striving for worldly goods. The longing for truth is extinguished by the sweetly flattering power of lies. And so there stands man, the only being in nature which does not fulfill its purpose. The only member of the totality of creation which is not worthy of the God who created it. But that benign creator could not hate his work. He wanted to raise it up to him and sent and he sent his son through whom he proclaimed to us. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. John 15, 3. And abide in me and I in you. John 15, 4. That young man's name was Karl Marx, the father of modern day communism. He went, later went on to London and recruited Lenin and Stalin and eventually wrote the Communist Manifesto. He gave birth to the communism that movement that we know today. Marx had head knowledge of Christ, but never heart knowledge. He had the right theology, but he did not have Jesus Christ in his heart and life. See, we have to first understand and perceive clearly the reality of God's purpose and person in our life. We have to see it. One of my, this is just one of the scenarios that in my imagination I try and put together. Uh, in verse 13, it says that there was, uh, it came about when Joshua was by Jericho. And then we're going to read ver the rest of that in just a, a, a minute. But you think about Joshua, he's a military commander, right? He's He's uh, he's a genius when it comes to military things. And so all along, Joshua is looking at Jericho. Now, human wisdom would suggest that he he create a siege. You know, he surrounds the city. He uses slings and catapults and digs trenches or starves the people into subjection. And that same wisdom would come up all kinds of schemes and scenarios and ways to conquer Jericho by their strength and their power. And so Joshua studied the massive city of Jericho and the walls were 20 feet thick and 30 feet wide, wide enough for two chariots to travel side by side around the city. He's this military man, ingenious, trying to figure out some way because it, God never said how he was going to conquer. He just said that it's yours and you're going to conquer it. So he's trying to figure it out, right? And in the same way, some of us, uh, we have a promise from God, and yet we're trying to figure out how to fulfill it. We often carry our own burdens and figure things out instead of giving our problems to God and letting him do some mighty work in our lives. So we're calculating the problem but we have to consider the person that's there. Continue on in verse 13. We'll back up and continue on. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man was standing opposite him with sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, rather I indeed come now as captain of the Lord of hosts. Now, can you... Can you figure out here what's going on? This man is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. He's captain of the Lord's people in charge of all the unseen angelic forces of heaven. And now he appears to a soldier. So soldier, soldier. This man, this officer, the captain, whose name is Joshua, who asked if he was on his side or the enemies. And he just simply said no. He, in other words, he didn't answer Joshua's question. He's saying no. Rather, indeed, I come now as the captain of the Lord of hosts. Get this. Jesus doesn't take sides. Jesus Christ doesn't take sides. Our responsibility is not to get God on our side, but to, for us to get on God's side. When he comes, he comes to take over and give victory in every area of our lives. In essence, the Lord said, I haven't come to take sides. I've come to take over. If we will just get on his side, we're going to be victorious over Jericho and live in Canaan and know the blessings of God in our lives. What is important is that we, our church, our family, us personally, we're on the Lord's side. Not that we're trying to get him on our side and agree to our plans and purposes. The, this man who has a sword in his hand is the advisor 
to administrators. He's the captain of conquerors. He's the deliverer of his disciples. He's the guide of all governors, the head of all heroes, the leader of all legislatures, and the master of the mighty. This Jesus is the overcomer of overcomers. He's the savior of all sinners. He's the teacher of all truth and the witness of the word of God. This same Jesus is the captain of God's children. He brings triumph and tragedy, stillness to our storms, help to the hopeless, and blessings to the broken. He brings nourishment to the needy, his spirit to the seeker, love to the lonely, instruction to the ignorant, and success to God's people. The man with the sword in his hand comes to minister to the committed who have sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who appears to Joshua on the banks of the Jordan, standing before Jericho. Those who are committed to him have life that can never die, love that can never be reduced. Can you see it? Righteousness that can never be disgraced, peace that can never be discovered, rest that can never be disturbed, joy that can never be diminished, hope that can never be disappointed, Glory that can never be dimmed. Light that can never be darkened. Happiness that can never be depressed. Strength that can never be disabled. Purity that can never be defiled. Beauty that can never be damaged. And wisdom that can never be erased. And the resources that will never be depleted. That's who's standing before us this morning right now. Are we on his side? You see, serving the man with the sword in his hand is marching into victory. Now, I have to confess that what I'm about to read to you is not original, and I can't find the source, but somebody will. Um, so I'm just going to read it, and then if you know the source, you can, you can comment and let me know, okay? In Genesis, he's the promised seed. Yeah, I'm going to go all the way through. Hang on. In Genesis, he's the promised seed. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the scapegoat. In Numbers, he's the brazen serpent lifted up on a pole. In Deuteronomy, he's the lawgiver. In Joshua, he's prophet, priest, and king. In Judges, he's the righteous judge. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he is the anointer. In Kings, he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. In Chronicles, he is our history. In Ezra, he is the rebuilder of the temple. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of the walls. In Esther, he is the savior of the Jews. In Job, he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Psalms, he is the song of the ages. In Proverbs, he is the wisdom of God. In Ecclesiastes, he is the great preacher. In the Song of Solomon, he is the wonderful lover. In Isaiah, he is wonderful counselor, prince of peace, mighty God, and everlasting father. In Lamentations, he is the great preacher. In Jeremiah, he's the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the restorer of the people of God. In Daniel, he's the stone cut with, the, with hands and the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is spurned, but he is the forgiving husband. In the minor prophets, he's the star that rises in Bethlehem's sky. In Matthew, he is the king of kings. In Mark, he's the suffering servant. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the mighty power of the church. And in Romans, he's the dynamite of the gospel. In Corinthians, he's the transformer of the carnal nature. In Galatians, he is the torn veil. In Ephesians, he's the heavenly one. In Philippians, he's the all-sufficient one. In Colossians, he's the preeminent one. In Thessalonians, he's the coming one. In Timothy, he's the great appearing God. In Titus, he is our blessed hope. In Philemon, he is the emancipator of all slaves. In, G in Hebrews, he's the best of all. In James, he's the true religion. In Peter's epistles, he's the rock of our salvation. In John's epistles, he is our assurance. In Jude, he is the one who is able to keep us from falling. And in Revelation, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords who is coming on the white horse. Whew. 
We need a fresh revelation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the man with the sword in his hand, and he has come not to take sides. He's come to take over and to give victory. We have to see his purpose. We have to see his person, and then we have to see his power. Verse 14. And Joshua fell on his face on the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord said? Uh, what has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. We will never see our, jo our Jerichos conquered until we lay our sword at the Lord's feet and prostrate ourselves before him in worship. Until we take what is in our hands and we lay it before him, our Jerichos will continue to stand. We must understand that conquering our enemies, conquering our Jerichos is not physical, it's spiritual. We're not going to experience victory through our might, but by his spirit. If we want victory over our Jerichos, we must learn to only glance at Jericho, but to stare, to gaze at Jesus. We have to keep our eyes off the problems and place them on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is interesting that this man, that Joshua, who was the captain, he actually became a servant. If we're to be victorious, we have to have the attitude of serving the Lord, of servitude. That day, Joshua lay down, prostrated himself, and worshiped God. Joshua gave everything he had to Jesus. Now think about this. Joshua had spent a lot of time alongside Moses in the tent of meeting. He had, this wasn't his really his first time to be in the presence of God. He had been around that for a while, a lot of years, in fact, maybe all 40 years, he had been around the presence of God. But this is the first time we see that now it's personal. Before it was Moses, he was with Moses. Moses and God were the ones who spoke to each other friend to friend. Now it's Joshua's turn. Joshua, what are you going to do? I know what Moses did. What are you going to do? I'm wondering how many of us are riding on the faith and the coattails spiritually of those that we're in relationship. We count on them to, to speak to God for us. We count on them to hear God for us. And we're not willing to get ourselves on our knees. We're not willing to lay our stuff down to hear God for ourselves. Maybe that's our challenge today. Maybe our challenge is that God is calling us to a, a different thing, a different level, personally, to come with him. God is very strategic that way. He will bring us to a place where we have to call on him and not call our neighbor. Now, it's okay to reach out to people for help and encouragement, but usually we should do that after we've gone to the Lord. All right, we're going to wrap it up. I love missionary stories. A uh, number of years ago, a, a missionary in West Africa led a group of men through the jungle to another village where they were, they were going to preach the gospel. They were going to tell a different tribe about Jesus. And one of the men was following some distance behind um, when uh, one of the men was following some distance behind when the missionary neared a log laying across the path and as he approached the log to step over the log a de deadly green mamba snake suddenly rose on its tail to a height that was equal to the missionary's height almost six feet tall now the poison of that green mamba snake is is strong enough to kill 30 guys easy and the missionary immediately stopped and stared right into the face of the snake he watched its tongue go in and out, you know, how they do. And he wondered if he should try and grab the snake. But he decided to be still and continue to stare. Now, he, he feared some men might try to come up behind and frighten the snake into, 
in some way and the snake would strike. But suddenly the Holy Spirit reminded this missionary of what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And this is what came in mind in Ephesians 6.13. And having done everything, stand firm. So he, he, in his spirit, he didn't say it out loud, but in his spirit, he just claimed that verse and he stood absolutely still, praying for the safety of himself and others, and that God would deliver him to strengthen his testimony for the people that they were going to minister to. And before long, as they stared at each other, the snake backed down and slithered away in, in through the brush. That would be a testimony, right? When we serve Christ, the enemy will sometimes raise his ugly head and make us look him right in the eye face to face. It happens. Victory over our adversary will come as we claim the word of God and keep our eyes on the one who's able to deliver us. God's word promises that the enemy of our souls is under our feet and we can have victory in every area of our life. We need to faithfully commit to him, worship him, and give him the glory. Then we can expect the life that God has promised us. We can expect that to come to pass in our lives every day in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it takes us surrendering our sword, getting down on our face before the Lord and saying, Lord, I just want to be on your side. I want to do things your way today. Because when the enemy comes, you can't stand in your own power. You have to stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Let that rest in your spirit. We're going to pick up our, our study uh, on the victorious life next week. And um, I, I trust that maybe the Lord's talking to you through this. He is to me. I, I'm enjoying just thinking about this and studying uh, about how God wants to bring us out to bring us in and, um, and the life change that we all can have. So I trust that you are thinking about these things. I don't, you know, that's the purpose of the devotional in the morning, just to get us to think and wonder, to surrender things to the Lord. Okay, that's it for today. Lord, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for the challenge in our spirit, Lord, to lay our stuff down and to worship you. Lord, to get to know you as all of those things that we just read um, and talked talk briefly about, Lord God, that you are all those things to us. And Lord, that uh, it's better for us to be on your side than to try and get you on our side. So Lord, we ask that today you would do a good work within us, Lord, a deep work of not only challenging our souls, but leading us by your spirit. Lord, I pray blessing over your people. Give them a great day, a great weekend. And Lord, we just thank you for that in Jesus name. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. We'll look forward to seeing you online on Sunday at 9, 30 and 11 or in person at Abundant Life. Foursquare Church and Hollister and uh, the same time, 9, 30 and 11. And Pastor Kevin is going to bring this awesome message uh, today or on Sunday and you're not going to want to miss it. So, all right. All right. God bless you. I'm out of here. Go spend time with Mary. Okay. Bye-bye.